Hey, everybody. As the uh, as everybody comes in, go ahead and use the chat and let us know where you're from. And uh, if you'd like to know more about Queen Conk, we'll get started here in just a moment. All right, and just as a quick introduction of myself, my name is Erin Lomax, and I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit at the St. Lucie County Aquarium. And welcome to the very first Marine Science in the Morning uh, program of the 2021 season. This series highlights current and recent marine science research that's presented by the researchers themselves. And this year we're focusing on women in STEM. STEM of course stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now this is an annual winter slash spring speaker series at the aquarium. And normally this is an in-person program, but this year it's going to be on a virtual platform. If you want more information about our upcoming speakers and links to register for those sessions, please visit our Facebook page. Uh, the address is facebook.com slash Smithsonian SMS. All right, and the link for that is actually in the, um, is in the uh, chat right now. And as everybody joins in, I wanna point out some of the features. You can use the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. It looks like two speech bubbles. And that will ask questions of our presenter. You can submit a question at any time. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions during this session as possible. If there are any questions that we don't get to, we will be posting our email address in the chat box. Uh, and you're welcome to email us your questions um, after the program as well. <clears throat> there is going to be another educator that's on in the background. That's Jamil Wilson. He's one of our education interns. And he's gonna be keeping track of your questions and he's gonna be posting links to various things in the chat as well. So if you see that, that's coming from Jamil. And throughout the program, you can also use that chat box to send us any messages. But just so you know, your comments are only visible to Smithsonian staff. So please make sure to keep your comments on topic and appropriate. Okay, well, it is 11.03, so let's go ahead and get started. I want to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, this is Laura Isaac Norton, everybody. Uh, Laura graduated with her bachelor's in biology from the University of Kentucky in 2018 and earned a master's in marine science and oceanography from Florida Atlantic University in 2020. And as a member of FAU Harbor Branch's Queen Conk Lab, Laura researches Queen Conk and participates in outreach to teach community members about the importance of this beautiful mollusk. Uh, Laura continues to, or hopes to continue her career in conch conservation and restoration. So this morning, we're gonna learn a little bit more about the queen of the sea, the queen conch. And we're also going to enjoy a short film that explores the plight of the conch. Now, if for any reason the video seems glitchy or laggy to you, Jamil will be posting a link uh, that'll take you to that video. You can actually watch it in your browser after the program if you'd like to do that. We're only gonna show a clip from it. And if you'd like to view um, the entire video that's online, you'll be able to do that as well. So Laura, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. The floor is yours, take it away. All right, thank you, Erin. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. Um, okay, here we go.
Okay, here we are. So um, thank you for that introduction, Erin, and I hope you all are excited and ready to learn about Queen Conk. Uh, so just to continue the introduction that Erin started for me, um, I went to school in Kentucky. I was born in Kentucky and raised there, but I was always introduced or uh, interested in marine science. So uh, that's not a great place to be if you want to work in the ocean. So I came to Florida to get my master's in marine science and oceanography. And I did that at FAU's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, which is also in Port Pierce, pretty close to the Smithsonian Marine Station. And I finished that degree in 2020, uh, back in May. And while I've been at Harbor Branch, I've been working with the Queen Conk Lab. So I was a intern with them in 2016 and 2017. And then I was a um, graduate research student in 2018 and 2019 and 2020. So um, the leader of uh, the Queen Conk Lab is Dr. Megan Davis. She's the scientist that I worked under. And um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about her and about uh, the research that we do in the Queen Conk Lab. So this is Megan here. Um, let's see if I can show that. Okay. Hopefully you can see my mouse here. This is Megan um, doing a beautiful tree pose. So um, Megan and the Queen Conk Lab, we have, a, a, we have a mission. And the mission is to grow the Queen Conk for the sake of the species the ecosystem and people who depend, depend on the fisheries. And Megan's vision and the lab's vision is for there to be a queen conch farm in every Caribbean nation. So we have four different pillars that we use uh, to meet this mission and this vision and our goals. And they are to protect or reestablish the breeding stocks, the queen conch breeding stocks, which you see here in this photo. And then um, we also use aquaculture for a seed stock. And we want to use conch ranching for food and for stock enhancement. And then, of course, outreach and social science um, with community members. Sorry about that, just one second. Sorry, my PowerPoint has seized up. I can't uh, move to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So um, let's talk a little bit more about what queen conch are, if you're not familiar with them. There are seven different types of conch, and you can see three different types here at the top of the screen. There is the queen conch, the large one, and then the one in the middle is a milk conch. And then there's a hawkwing conch. Those are just three of the seven uh, conch species. And we research queen conch in the queen conch lab. And this map that you see here on the screen, this shows the habitat range for the queen conch. It's pretty large. They reside in Bermuda, South Florida, the Bahamas, and throughout the Caribbean. And conch are a cultural icon. They're very important culturally and economically to the Caribbean nations. And this documentary film that I'm gonna be showing in just a few minutes is gonna go um, much further into this topic. But before uh, I show the film, I wanna talk a little bit about the conch's very unique life cycle. So conch, um, there's a male and a female conch. You can see the male here at top picture and then the female conch uh, here is the second or the bottom picture. And they come together for internal fertilization and a female lays egg masses. So this egg mass that's on the um, sandy bottom of the ocean is about as big as a croissant pastry. And a female can lay about nine egg masses every summer. And in each egg mass, there's about half a million eggs inside. So that's 4.5 million eggs laid every summer on average. Now the crazy thing is, only one or two conchs survive out of that 4.5 million uh, back to adulthood. And that's just the way nature is. It's a circle of life. There's um, the conch lay eggs to replace themselves. So once a female conch lays eggs, the eggs will hatch into these pelagic floating larvae. They're called villagers. 
And these villagers float in the water column and grow and develop for two to three weeks. And at that point, they'll re they're ready for metamorphosis. So they metamorphose just like a butterfly would into a benthic crawling snail. And at this point, the um, conch is very, very small with a teeny tiny shell and they burrow into the sand and they grow for four years. And at that point, they're large enough to be an adult conch and ready for um, reproduction again. So the shell that they hatch out of the eggs with and the shell that they have when they metamorphose, that's the exact same shell that they have when they're big, strong conch. It just grows throughout their life. And conch are a prey to animals throughout their uh, entire life cycle and they're an important food source to humans as adults. So, um, so like I said, they have a really unique life cycle. So at this point, I wanna introduce the film that we're gonna be watching today. It is called For the Love of Conk. It's a beautiful documentary and it's produced by Beau Bardart. And this is a shortened version of the full length documentary. It's about 20 minutes. And it really captures the importance of conch and it features interviews from Dr. Davis, the, um, the scientist that, from the Queen Conk Lab. And it also has video clips from our research in the Bahamas. Um, so I really hope you enjoy it and we will meet back up when the video is over. Uh, hopefully this video plays and it's not lagging on your end, but if it does, there should be a link to the video in the comments where you can go back and watch it on your own. For millennia, these banks have been home to the Queen Conch. Since people first inhabited the islands, they have relied on the conch to survive. But for the last 20 years, researchers and fishermen in the Bahamas have noticed a steep decline in the conch population surrounding many islands. The future of the conch in the Bahamas is at risk. And so is the Bahamian heritage of catching and eating conch that has developed over generations. concern about conch in the future is whether or not it'll always be there. At some point we have to be concerned as to whether or not there'll be an issue of over conking. Conch is so synonymous with our culture. I don't even want to try to imagine what life would be without conch. The conch population if it's overfish, that means unemployment. The Strombus Gigas is the popular conch that most Bahamians eat. We have over 7,000 square miles of conch in the Bahamas. Most of our conchs come from the northern part of the Bahamas and not the south. We have Long Island, Exuma, Crooked Island Islands, Meguana, Inagua. 
Our conks basically come from Elutra, Andros, the Berry Islands, sometimes Abaco. That's only a small portion of our country that we get conks from. It's such an important commercial species for the livelihood of the fishermen here. So it's really important to have a balance of sustainable fishing practices and also at the same time, conservation of the animal. I grew up in Mars Bay. The community basically make their living off conch. With a shortage of jobs in the island, this is how they make their money for their family. That's how they survive, through being a conker. <laughs> the other part of the fishing industry, crawfish and bone fishing is seasonal. When the season is low in those other areas, they rely on conking. My granddaddy was a boatsman, a fisherman in the settlement. It would have been a great experience to just jump in a sailboat with him early morning, sail out on the conking ground, put a water glass down there and basically see everything on the bottom clear. The experience of just hooking that conk. Doing things like that was a blessing. To really appreciate where we come from in terms of conking, you need to blend the young and old together. I started diving for conch from 1960. We never hooked small conch. We always thought it was well for them to really get mature fights. So today I see people, they rake up everything, small and big, and my time, we never do that. With more than 9,000 fishermen in the Bahamas, Conk provides a steady source of income. Queen Conk is very important to the Bahamian people. We know a lot of lobster fishermen turn to the Queen Conk during the summertime, and so that's part of our consideration. One of my roles at Bahamas National Trust is to coordinate the conservation campaign. That, that could work because the Bahamas has... It's a national collaboration to help create a sustainable Queen Conk fishery in the Bahamas. And what that means is basically educating the general public, educating policymakers, help everyone understand that there is a problem with conch and that everyone can do something to ensure that we have conch for the future. Fishermen, they're not sure that they could come back with a mature conch. They have to go farther and farther out to sea. They have to spend more gas. Anywhere in the world, in any fishery, if you have an increased cost per unit effort, you know your fishery is in trouble. And that's what we see. There has always been a thriving fishing community in the Florida Keys. And just like in the Bahamas, Queen Conk was historically one of its signature species. The Florida Keys have always been known as the Conk Republic. There are Conk hotels, there are Conk restaurants everywhere. So conch has been iconic here. The local populace recognized that conch had declined to a point that they were very concerned. State and federal governments closed conch to fishing in the mid-1980s. The conch population has declined throughout the Caribbean. Along with the state of Florida, the nations of Bermuda, Costa Rica, and Jamaica have issued total bans on conch fishing. Nearby countries have established closed seasons and quotas and they strictly regulate exports. The greatest threat to the conch survival in the Bahamas may be the widespread harvesting of juvenile conch before they have a chance to reproduce. You need baby conch to grow into a mature animal to reproduce to make more conch. So if we're not protecting the babies or the juvenile stock, then we're not allowing the population enough time to grow and rebound for us to have enough conch to fish. I 
I fell in love with a conch when I was 16 and I was sailing in the Bahamas with my family. I got to understand how important the conch was, how much it meant to the fishermen. And I said, one day I think that there won't be enough conch to last forever. The juvenile habitats are made up of a lot of seagrass, more in shallow water, where there's lots of good sunlight that grows the algae on the surfaces that the conch graze. Typically, nurseries are found where the villagers, the larvae of the conch, come in for settlement. The villagers are out there swimming around, and then they find some nursery area, and they settle to the bottom, and that's where they grow. If you look very closely at the tip of any conch shell, that's where the larval shell or the villager shell, when they hatch out of the eggs, that's where it all starts. After the conch metamorphose in their nursery habitat, they typically stay in that nursery area from the time they metamorphose all the way until they're one or one and a half years old. I have never lost the passion for the animal from that day that I first was introduced to the conch. We got the eye stalks, we got the proboscis, the snout they use for eating. Regardless of their age, as long as they're alive, they can continue to reproduce. The males can find the females from their scent trail. That way, the male can track down the female. they copulate in order to fertilize the eggs. She can store that sperm for many weeks, and she might have multiple males that have contributed to that sperm. That way, when the eggs are fertilized, they're fertilized by a multitude of different sperm, possibly from many different males, which helps to have some good genetic variation. A female typically lays nine egg masses every season, with her peak laying in the middle of the summer. Each time a female lays an egg mass, she lays about half a million eggs. Less than 1% survive all the way to maturity. And that's how nature is. Nature produces enough eggs to be able to replenish the female or the male that has helped to lay those eggs. They need to be together in what we call aggregation, where the males and females can come together for them to be able to spawn during the summer months. If they're too fished out or too spread out from overfishing, then they won't be able to find each other in order to reproduce. In general, you need more than about 200 conch in an area just a little bit over two acres. There are very, very few areas in the Caribbean where it's open for fishing, where you exceed that 200 number, and therefore reproduction does not occur. The Conservation Campaign set out to inform the public about how to protect juvenile conch and ultimately save the Bahamas conch population overall. In order for the conservation campaign to actually achieve its goal of creating a sustainable fishery, we need to really ramp up education, specifically with fishermen. Research by Community Conk involved measuring the total length of the shell, the lip thickness of the shell, and sampling the reproductive organs and there was a very strong correlation that showed the thick lip conchs are the conchs that had reproduced. How long have you been involved with the fishery? Obviously about 20 years. So what do you think about the conch population? Do you think it's different from maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago? From my point of view, uh, yes. 
it's gotten worse. One of the big things that we have been trying to push or trying to educate the community on is some of the research that showed the maturity of the count is related to the thickness of the lips on the shell. The legislation says you can harvest a conch that has a well-formed, fully flaring lip. I think uh, according to the law now, it's a thickness of a penny. A penny, yes. What the research has shown is that a mature conch is a conch that has a lip thickness of at least 15 millimeters. 15 millimeters is about the size of the diameter of the bohemian penny. From the tip of the starfish to the other tip of the starfish, that's 15 millimeters. A big difficulty we've had was explaining to fishermen what 15 millimeters looks like. The conch that has a thin lip or no lip, they have not reproduced yet. With the new policy that we are recommending based on the research, this would be a mature legally harvested conch and this would not. Even though it's bigger. Even though it's, that's correct, good, correct. yeah, even though it's this way bigger. Yeah. A lot of fishermen expressed some serious concern that they could not find conch that had a lip thickness of 15 millimeters. And the follow-up question from them is, well, what do you want us to do? We want to do the right thing, but if we cannot find a conch that is mature, then you want us to not fish conch? We really need to understand how to help them solve the issue of what should I be doing to provide for my family if we truly want to save the fishery? At this point, awareness has improved. Yeah, we got a bigger conch that's probably younger than this conch. But because the general public will see the conch size, they will think that this conch is a younger conch. But the thickness of the shell shows the age of the conch. It's kind of like us. We all build in different size and different shape. Conking is allowed year-round. The other fisheries that we have seasons for, they're economically important, but when the season stops and you can't fish for those, conch is the fallback fishery. Scientists feel that the conch is most vulnerable when they're breeding. It's also the same time that crawfish are breeding. So you will have a closed season for conch and crawfish, which may overlap. Fishermen may find that unbearable because they turn to conch when the crawfish season is closed. No one wants to hear that there's a closed season, but if you have to reduce the amount of conch, it has to come from somewhere. Whatever measures that we come up with, they might seem stringent now, when you compare it to the possibility of losing conch forever, which has happened in other places, then that puts them into their proper perspective. The Exuma Key Land and Sea Park is a marine protected area, or MPA. It contains one of the largest, healthiest stock of conch in the Bahamas. When the MPA's conch move on their own beyond the park boundaries, they provide spillover catch for local fishermen. Here in Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, where there is a no-take zone since 1986, we see greater conch beds of mature and juveniles, and that's because it hasn't been fished in so many years. There aren't commercial activities taking place in the park. If we have a network of these MPAs protecting the conch, protecting grouper, protecting lobster, and all our species, they will multiply and then they'll spill over into the areas that we are allowed to fish. So far, there are 21 marine protected areas throughout the Bahamas, which also function as public parks. Managed by the Bahamas National Trust, they offer a safe haven for conch and other marine life to grow and reproduce. We are going to work with many partners in the Bahamas to establish what we call an egg farm. And an egg farm is an area that's enclosed. And you'll bring together the adult males and the adult females, and you'll put them in a ideal habitat. The egg farm in the Mariah Harbor Key National Park, which is near Great Exuma, we have Bahamian interns and assistants and fishermen all working with us on this project. 
In order to be successful, each female should lay two to five egg masses over the three month season. By increasing the number of eggs, there'll be more larvae in the water, and hopefully at the end, there'll be more juveniles as well. This type of restoration of the Queen Kong can be another way of looking at a sustainable livelihood. So not only being able to continue to fish Kong, but also learning how to do conservation and restoration of the species as well. This is the very first time that an egg farm has been used for the sole purpose of restoration and conservation. At the same time, all the Bahamas conch need more protection. We really need better enforcement. And in order to do that, the government needs to make that decision and act on it. It's really gonna take a collective effort to address this issue. So right now, we are asking all Bahamians to moderate themselves on how we catch the Kong, the size of the Kong, the age of the Kong. We got to study the Kong, what to take out of the water and what we must leave for the next generation, for another catch, for another day, for another month, for another year. Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed that video. Uh, it always brings a smile to my face when I see um, that production by Bo Bodart. Um, so the video uh, ended with some uh, footage and a little bit of talk about the egg farm that was going on in the Maya Herbertie National Park. So that was um, my master's thesis research that we were conducting in partnership with uh, quite a few local agencies there and in partnership with um, some Bahamian interns. So that's what I'd like to spend the rest of the talk uh, exploring a little bit further into. Um, the title of this research was to uh, the reestablishment of an adult queen conch Labatus gigas population in a marine protected area in the Bahamas. And this research took place May 26th through August 16th in 2019. Um, so like the video said, this was research to repopulate an overfished area, which was um, a national park, um, Mariah Harbor Key National Park. And it once had a conch in it, uh, according to locals, but, um, but uh, in 2019, when they got there, there were very, very few conch. So uh, the hopes was that we would bring back in, reestablish an adult population with the hopes that they would start laying eggs and um, provide villagers in juvenile conch for generations to come in the Bahamas. You, so you saw this, um, you saw this map in the For the Love of Conch film, and it's just showing uh, all the different national parks throughout the Bahamas. And I'm gonna zoom in onto the one that's right about in the center. Uh, that is the Exumas, and that's where this research took place. So you can see here uh, the Exuma Land and Sea Park in the northwestern part of the um, uh, Exuma Keys. And then down closer to Georgetown um, in the southeastern region, you can see the Mariah Harbor Key National Park. So the Exuma Land and Sea Park is a very old um, national park that's doing well, has a large population and you saw footage of that in the film. So um, let's zoom in a little further to Maya Harbor Key National Park. So uh, this is this is the borderline of Maya Harbor Key National Park. Um, it's a very large park. It's about it's a little over 14 acres. Um, so um, if you go in even closer in between two of the keys here, you can see our exact study site. So this is Elizabeth Key and Guana Key. And there's a little cut in between the two. And this is a image from Google Earth that you were actually able to see the exact outline of our enclosure. So this red circle shows the exact size um, and placement of our study site. So um, let's get into the setup of the experiment. Uh, like you saw uh, in the video, the underwater circular enclosure 
was in a area where we had previously seen a female laying in mass in a, um, in a historic breeding site. So to have that enclosure set up, we had scuba divers come in and set that up for us. And it was 1400 meters square, it was very large, and it was in a back reef area. It was near um, a coral reef and there was lots of seagrass, lots of areas for the conch to feed. And the temperature in that area was 27.4 to 32.6 degrees Celsius. And the current was about one knot. So it was perfect for snorkeling and we ended up doing all of our observations via snorkel and free diving. So we stocked the enclosure with conch as you're seeing in this photo. But before we stocked them, we entered the enclosure, we did quite a few measurements on the conch and we tagged them so that we could keep track of each individual conch. We actually had 251 conchs, so it was quite a few to keep track of. And there was about a one-to-one -one sex ratio of males to females, which is what you would see in the wild. Um, so like you saw in the video, measuring the lip thickness of the conch can be a metric of the age of adult conch. And the research has so shown that most of the time when a conch's lip is 15 millimeters thick, it is an adult. So after measuring, um, after collecting our conch, we measured them. And according to that 15 millimeter metric, 67% of our conch were adults. Um, and these conch that we put into the enclosure, they were purchased from local fishermen who had planned on selling these conch for market. So um, just like the footage that you saw in the film where the conch were, um, tied together in strings and brought up by hooks. That's exactly how these conch were handled before we purchased them and, um, and put them into our enclosure. So in addition to lip thickness, we also measured the shell length, which is what you're seeing here in the center picture. And then on the far right picture, you're seeing um, our tags that we tagged our conch with, and they're actually uh, cattle livestock tags, and they worked very well. So at this point in the study, this is what our setup looked like. Um, like I said, the enclosure is very large, so I wasn't able to get a picture of the whole thing, but hopefully this will give you a visual uh, representation. So there's a very beautiful reef that at the closest point the enclosure was about two meters from. And near that reef area, the um, substrate at the bottom of the enclosure was coarse sand and lots of um, reef rubble. And the depth was about four meters. And the enclosure got more shallow as we got further away from the reef. And there was very thick seagrass beds of Thalassia testudium. There was also a few other species, but that was the most dominant species. And the depth there was um, at the shallowest 2.5 meters. So um, after we set up our enclosure, we uh, did lots and lots of observations. We visited the enclosure over 42 different times during the study period. And um, we had lots of different things that we were looking for while we were at the enclosure. We did monthly bib fix surveys, which are these first two photos that you're seeing here, where um, the Bahamian intern that we worked with, CJ, did a great job of free diving and counting the different species and the abundance of those species inside um, these quadrats so we could monitor the flora of the enclosure throughout the season. We also monitored the fauna or the different animal species that came in and out of the enclosure. Uh, over the study period, we tracked the conch's movement, which is what you're seeing me do in this third circle picture. Um, and we did that with the conch tags. So we would um, track the conch and where they were going. And we visited the enclosure every 24 to 48 hours. So we had a pretty good idea of what they were doing um, through those observations. And then we also were looking out for any reproductive behavior. Like I said, we were looking out for egg masses or any breeding of conch. And from time to time, I would have to repair the enclosure um, from heavy currents or a storm, or I'd have to repair a conch tag um, that had fallen off. So that's what you're seeing me do with the sandbag here in the fourth picture. That was always fun. So our results from um, this study show that these conch were um, it was successful to translocate these conch into this MPA for, um, for restoration. These conch traveled a really far distance to get to our study site. The area where the fishermen were fishing for these conch was over 100 kilometers away. So they had a very long journey um, to get to our study site and we had very, very high survival. So that was really exciting. 
Over the summer, we saw increased fauna sightings. So uh, as the comp got established and the enclosure was established, we saw more and more um, different fish species coming in. And so that is uh, indicating that we, there may have been increased biodiversity by placing conch back into that area. And one of the most dramatic uh, things that we noticed after the study was over was how the conch cleaned the seagrass very, very well. And that's what you're seeing in this picture here. On the right side of that fencing enclosure is where the conch were living for um, the study period. And you can see how clean that seagrass is and how there's not very much detritus or dead. Um, seagrass leaves laying on the sediment. And then on the left side of the uh, fencing, that's area where there wasn't any conch. The, um, and you can see that that seagrass looks like it has lots of filamentous stuff on it. And that is just the detritus or the dead seagrass um, laying on the seafloor, as well as lots of algae that the conch were able to clean up from the area that they were living in. Unfortunately, we did not find any egg masses this summer. But we do believe that that was due to the stress that the conch went through during their translocation. As you saw in the film, um, when conch are being fished for food, they aren't always handled very gently. So we think that that may have caused a stress. And because of that stress, we hypothesized that the conch resorbed their gonads and weren't actually able to reproduce during the summer. We did see evidence that the conch were repairing their shells and hopefully future research will be able to tell us if they were um, regenerating their gonads throughout the study period. So in the future, when uh, these studies are continued, we really recommend that the translocation of the conch happens much earlier in the year before the breeding season so that they are able to um, settle in from that translocation and uh, repair their gonads if any of them were resorbed and um, just be really set to go for the breeding season. Um, so um, next up is my conclusion slide. So from the study, uh, it, although it did not turn out as we expected, we did see evidence that conch was a keystone species because of the role that it played in the ecosystem. And the Queen Conch Lab can, is planning on continuing work in the Maria Harbor Key National Park, which is very exciting. And um, we just published this past week a uh, Queen Conch Aquaculture Manual. Um, so that is gonna be a wonderful resource where people who want to farm Queen Conch can use, uh, can go back and use this manual and um, learn step-by-step -step how to do it. And because of this manual, there are um, lots of countries throughout the Caribbean, uh, inc including Puerto Rico, that are starting to build a conch hatchery or are interested in starting to grow conch for um, the restoration of the species, but also for alternative livelihoods for fishermen and education of their communities. So we're really excited where, um, where we're going to looking into the future and seeing where this research takes us next. And we just hope that um, we continue to save the queen with this research. So I would like to thank um, the people who helped with uh, get this research rolling and um, especially thank our partners for this research project that happened in 2019. And those included Harbor Branch, the Bahamas National Trust, the Department of Marine Resources in the Bahamas, Dive Exuma, and the Exuma Foundation. So with that, um, I will take any questions and I just encourage you all to keep in touch with the Queen Conch Lab. Um, I have my personal Instagram and, excuse me, Dr. Davis's Instagram, which is our, also our lab Instagram. Um, and on there, you can stay up to date with all the different projects that we're working on. We post on there fairly frequently. I have my personal email and the website for queenconchaquaculture.org. That's our lab website. So you can learn a lot more um, about Queen Conch and uh, see how you can get involved. So thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, we wanna take a few minutes to, uh, to answer some of the questions that the um, audience has been waiting very patiently for. So thank you so much for that. Uh, that was fascinating. I feel like every time I hear a presentation about Queen Conks, I learn something new. So, uh, and I'm sure that's a really rewarding field to be in as well. Uh, has a very direct impact on not only conks, but on human populations as well. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
All right. So uh, the first question, just a quick one. This actually comes from uh, one of our volunteers at the aquarium. Uh, she's just asking if you could repeat what the survival rate for the eggs are, for the conch eggs. Sure. So in the wild, um, it's a very low survival rate for um, conch eggs um, all the way through to maturity. Um, it's about one to two percent um, or if you think about it this way, if there's about 4.5 million eggs laid for a female every summer in the wild, then um, only one to two maybe reach maturity. As you saw in the video, there's very few places now that have dense enough populations for conch to find each other and actually lay those egg masses. But in aquaculture, the survival rate can be about 80 to 90%, which is really exciting. So that's why we're trying to push um, aquaculture in collaboration with restoration. Okay, it actually links into another question that came through uh, from Lewis. Uh, he asks, what stage are the conchs grown to in aquaculture and do you guys release them when they get to be that size? That's a great question. Um, so it really just depends on the hatchery that you've worked on uh, or that, you're, that they're being grown in and um, their capacity of that area. So to do grow out to get the conch from, um, you know, like a juvenile size all the way up to adult size, you need lots and lots of area out in a shallow seagrass bed. So, um, so uh, the hatchery that we were working in, in the Exuma that you saw a little bit of footage in, it was a very tiny room. We were growing those conch through metamorphosis and then we released them back into the wild um, to continue growing from there. So it really just depends on, um, the size of the hatchery, but uh, there's obviously many ways that you can contribute to restoration no matter how large you grow the conch. Okay, great. Um, Carol had a really interesting question that, that I'm curious to, um, as to the answer. Uh, she asks, how is climate change and ocean pollution affecting conchs? And are there nursery fields like the ones in the Bahamas? Do you find those anywhere else in the world? Okay. Um, yeah, those are some great questions. So there is a, there, there's quite a bit of research going on right now about um, ocean acidification and how that affects shell building of lots of different mollusks or animals that have shells. And then there's also some um, research happening about uh, microplastics in queen conch. The queen conch lab at Harbor Branch doesn't focus um, on any either of those topics right now, but I'm sure I can uh, link Carol up with the scientists that do if you want to read some really interesting papers about that. Um, they have been, if I remember correctly, I have read some papers where um, they are finding microplastics inside conch, um, but at this point you find microplastics inside of many uh, ocean mammal or animals. Uh, but ocean acidification is a great worry because it's harder for conch to build that big strong shell um, as the ocean acidifies. Uh, and then on to the question about the, um, the juvenile habitats. So the queen conch um, habitat range is only in the Caribbean and then the, in Bermuda. So you're not gonna find um, queen conch juvenile grounds in other parts of the world outside of their uh, habitat range, but there are other places throughout the Caribbean that you can find um, those large dense breeding grounds or those juvenile habitats. And uh, right now it's, places that aren't very populated with fishers or people who go and fish. It's pretty remote areas um, where they can stay safe or it's very deep down in the ocean where people can't go diving for them. And the, uh, the enclosures like we saw on the video um, with, with researchers putting the males and the females together, is that happening anywhere else in the Caribbean that you know of or just in the Bahamas? Um, so that was the first time that that process had been done for the sole purpose of restoration. That process has been done before um, to provide a steady stream of egg masses to a um, conch hatchery or a conch farm. And uh, Dr. Davis was um, one of, was the head researcher for the Turks and Caicos Queen Conch Farm. And that's the same process that they use there. Unfortunately, that farm is no longer in operation. So, um, other countries might be doing this for small scale um, aquaculture purposes, but uh, as far as I know, that was the only, or in the Bahamas, that was the only conch or egg farm that was being used for the purpose of restoration. 
Okay, great. We um, now we, <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so Ronan has had some really fantastic questions um, during this session. And Ronan, I apologize, I am probably pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, but uh, the first question was, what creates the beautiful pinks, oranges, and purples of the conch shell? Is that something that they're eating in their diet that does that? Or do you got, or, or what is that? That's a really great question. So I don't know if anybody um, has heard or seen of a conch pearl or um, heard of the process that oysters make pearls. But it's a very similar um, process. So the queen conch has um, a mantle, which is just a, a part of your body. And as that rubs in and uh, up against the inside of the shell, it uh, puts down lacquer or like a lacquer-like substance. Um, and continues to make that really shiny, beautiful, bright shell. And um, I am not exactly sure why, and somebody else might know this, but I'm not exactly sure why uh, conch, different conch look like they have different colors. But um, in my experience, the conch that I've seen in the exumas have very bright colors and uh, conch from other parts of the Caribbean don't have the same coloration. Um, older conch aren't as bright as younger conch, so um, it's mostly the mantle that's putting down that color and, um, and creating those really bright, fiery colors, but I'm sure there's other uh, environmental factors that go into exactly what color they are. Okay, great. Yeah, I know that's always questions that, that we get at the aquarium as well. Why is this fish this color? Why is this shell that color? Yeah. And the cool thing about science is that even though there's research being done, sometimes we don't have like a concrete answer for it. And I always think that's cool when there's still mm -hmm. mysteries in the world, things to be exactly. solved. So I love uh, we had a from that one guy in the film that said, uh, conquer just like us, we, like none of us look alike. They're all different shapes and sizes. I think that was yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple of questions that are very similar, so I'll just uh, kind of combine those. Um, I know that uh, in the video there was, um, or during your presentation, there was a mention of how conch um, helped to increase biodiversity by um, attracting different fauna. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that um, and how that increased after introducing conch back into the environment? Sure, sure. So, um, so this was that part of the study was more of a pilot um, scale study because unfortunately we were not able to track the fauna that was in that area of the national park before we placed our conch there. So we don't really have a metric of what it was before. But we know, what we do know is that um, every 24 or 48 hours we were in the enclosure writing down what fauna species we saw. And they did increase um, as the um, as as the months went on. Uh, so, like I said, conch are prey species to many many animals. So um, they're prey to octopuses, sharks, stingrays, turtles, lobsters, fish, humans. So um, you know when you have a conch in an area, you know all these predators are coming in, and not all of those animals are predators at the adult stage. But um, we did have stingrays coming into the enclosure, um, like checking out the conch. And I think it was probably because they, they understood that was a prey species. The conch were too large for them to get into their mouth to bite down. Um, we also uh, did have some sharks visit the enclosure. Um, we had an octopus uh, prey upon a conch. That was the only one we lost uh, to, a, to a predation event, but there was an octopus. Um, so it was really interesting to see the study rise of fauna encounters throughout the um, throughout the study period and I go much deeper into that during my uh, thesis defense presentation which is recorded so if anybody really wants to hear about that uh, those results and that part of the research um, I can send you the link to that. Yeah, you're more than welcome to, to put that link in the chat. We have had a couple okay. questions about it. So I think there are some people who are very interested to learn a little bit more. Yeah, it's um, very interesting. It just, um, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's always good to, to have that uh, available for, for people to take a look at. Uh, we have another question from a colleague of 
Dr. Megan Davis, actually, who is a fellow oh, okay. marine biologist. Uh, Gail asks, in my experience collecting conch egg masses for the University of Miami, the queen conchs preferred to lay egg masses in wide sand covered areas in deeper water. Mm -hmm. So she asks, are there any areas in your enclosure that are covered in sand? Yes, that's a great, um, that's a great point and a great question. Yeah, that, um, there was an area of the enclosure that was very sandy. Um, we, uh, ex and it had very poor sand, which conch prefer to lay their egg masses in poor sand and not very silty sand. So the, there was areas for them to do that in the enclosure. And it wasn't very deep. Like I said, the deepest part was four meters. Um, we were restricted by snorkeling um, and not being able to scuba dive um, the enclosure. But we have evidence that conch will lay in those shallower areas. So um, something that we would like to try in the future is trying a pin or an enclosure in a deeper area of the park um, if we are able to scuba dive that. So that is something that could have attributed to not finding conch, but, um, but from uh, our observations, there were areas if they wanted to lay, they could. So that's why we were thinking it could have had something to do with the gonads. Okay, great. Um, I know we're running a little bit short on time, so we'll just do a couple more questions. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, Jamil has posted our email address in the chat. It's smseducation at si.edu. You're more than welcome to send us an email. And uh, for any questions that we're not able to answer, we'll be happy to send them on to Laura. Uh, so the next question I'm kind of interested in uh, comes from Jody, And she asks, as the juveniles grow, will the adults be moved out so that the enclosure won't be overpopulated? Uh, that's a good question. So um, if you remember in the uh, diagram that I showed of the conch life cycle, there is a two to three week span where the conch villagers hatch from the egg mass and float up into the water column. So they actually act as plankton uh, at that point during those two to three weeks and they flow with the current. So um, most of the time uh, we wouldn't ever expect conch that were hatched in the enclosure to settle back down into the enclosure because there was so much current in that area that they would have been taken out into the Exuma Sound and um, taken up the Exuma Keys and finding a nice place there to settle. So, um, so with that, there shouldn't be any overcrowding from the juveniles, um, but that is uh, something that we did encounter where every now and then a juvenile would pop up out of the sand because they stay in the sand to stay safe um, when they're younger and we would, um, and so we would have to account for that um, density change when we were doing the study, but um, but at this point we don't we don't expect uh, overcrowding. Okay, great. Well, last question. Um, and again, if if we're not able to get to your question today, I do apologize. Go ahead and send us an email, and we'll be happy to get an answer for you. Uh, the last question comes from Noah. And the question is, uh, what are the fishing regulations for conch? I know in Florida, it's, uh, it's totally off limits, but do you think that they're strict enough Caribbean wide or would you like to see stricter regulations as a researcher? Okay, um, so there are, I think about 32. Good morning, this is Mika Davis. Oh. I'm, um, please sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, I was pulling up my thesis for um, those who would ask for that. We'll let, um, Meg, we'll let Megan chime in, yeah, right? Megan wants to chime in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are about uh, 32 different um, island nations throughout the Caribbean, and each of them have their sep own separate governments, and they um, manage their fisheries separately. So um, there aren't Caribbean-wide um, restrictions on clean conch because of that. So like you said, uh, Florida uh, has had a ban on clean conch, clean conch fishing since the 70s. And um, the people at Florida Fish and Wildlife are doing a great job monitoring those um, and getting a better understanding on the conch stocks. So um, we, you know, 
policy is just one way to save the conch or uh, to go towards saving the conch. I think another um, big component of that is working with policy as well as um, uh, working with the fishermen and uh, farming conch, protecting the stocks that you have. So I don't think um, making a hard decision about policy will fix things. I think working together with policymakers um, to incorporate uh, restoration, conservation, aquaculture will um, be much more successful. Okay, great. All right, well, it's about noon, so I, I don't wanna keep you uh, any longer, Laura, but thank you so much for joining us today and for being our presenter. I thought it was fascinating and I think uh, all of our audience members thought so as well. Uh, Jamil has posted links to uh, areas uh, like our social media, our website. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for future marine science in the morning, uh, you can do so from our Facebook page, our Facebook events page. That's uh, facebook.com slash Smithsonian SMS. Um, so our next Marine Science in the Morning presentation will be on Wednesday, July, or January 27th. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, at 11 a.m., we will be featuring Dr. Valerie Paul, who is the director of the Smithsonian Marine Station. So the link to register for that will be on our Facebook page. You can also find that on our website as well, stlucyco.gov slash aquarium. And again, if we weren't able to get to your questions today, please just send us an email, let us know. A recording of this presentation will be available on our YouTube page probably tomorrow once we get that up. And I, again, I wanna thank all of our attendees for joining and Laura for presenting. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. I hope this really piqued your interest in Clean Conk and I hope you stay connected with us through um, our journey. Thank you yeah, all. Absolutely. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye.